This is The Red Line, where we interview three big geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. It's the coldest part of winter here in Australia at the moment. And at this time of the year, where for about two months, my pet chickens stop laying eggs and instead conserve their energy to stay warm. So for the first time in almost a year, I had to go buy eggs from the supermarket. So I went down and I get to the egg section and check out the options. There's farm fresh, cage free and free range, charging four, five and seven dollars respectively. Now the people that have grown up around farms know that cage free means 10,000 hens in a shed and the free range means the shed is one square meter per chicken. But the majority of people seem to envision free range being an open green happy farm with workers picking up eggs from around the field with little thatched baskets. All that aside though, the thing that did interest me was the fact that the farm fresh, a term that usually means the chickens are kept in microwave sized cages, were all completely sold out. The whilst the other two still had good amounts of stock, it was the cheapest, nastiest eggs that had flown off the shelf. In my morbid curiosity, I turned to the teenage employee stacking the pasta shelf behind me and asked, how often do these eggs get filled? And without hesitation, he replied that they get filled nearly every day. The others, once a week. I would like to think that there isn't a single person out there who wants their eggs to come from a chicken that is in worse conditions. And I'm sure that if you asked 1,000 people, pretty much 1,000 would tell you that they would prefer the chickens to be happy and running around in green pasture on a sunny day. But for just $1 in savings, the majority of people chose the eggs from the poorest conditions. Just because of that $1 difference, that farmer is selling a whole lot more eggs. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not to talk about farming standards, but instead talk about human trafficking and slavery in today's global supply chain. It's an issue that's been on the periphery of so many of our previous pieces, but we've always felt it deserved a full focus. So let's talk about human trafficking, which includes labor trafficking and sex trafficking as its two main components. And these are happening every day in every country, in almost every industry. And for the most part, you'd probably never even know. Even the industries you think would be immune to this sort of thing, like your favorite trendy coffee shop or the office supply store down the road, may have human trafficking lurking just under the surface. Your favorite little coffee shop, for example, probably put a good amount of money into buying that fancy coffee machine. And the owner probably had to pick between a few different machines. In his mind, he had a few boxes he had to tick, it had to be able to make a certain amount of products, but as long as all those boxes are ticked, he inevitably went with whatever the cheapest one was, much like our free range versus farm fresh eggs from earlier on. And much like our eggs, if these two coffee machines do relatively the same thing, why is one of them much cheaper than the other? Usually it's cheaper because that company has cut costs somewhere, knowing that if they could go to market with a cheaper product, people deciding between them and a very similar competitor will probably pick them due to them being cheaper. So when that company was designing the machine and the math began to come up with similar costs to their competitors, they would go looking for a way to make it cheaper. And when they come across a parts manufacturer overseas who can sell them the parts they need at 60% of the cost of everyone else, well, that's where they can find their savings. Those savings will lower the cost. And that lowered cost probably means the difference between selling 100 coffee machines or 100,000 coffee machines. So they buy the cheaper parts, either not knowing how they're making them or not wanting to know how they're made. So the coffee machine manufacturer doesn't want to know why they're cheaper. The coffee store owner doesn't know where the wiring or the chips and the parts came from. And the person drinking the coffee probably doesn't know that that coffee was made by that machine because parts of it were made by slaves to undercut the market. Even the people who might be 99% sure that's what's going on have very little incentive to actually look that deeply into it. In fact, for most manufacturers, they make a lot more money personally if they don't. Many would argue that all of this is just an inevitable part of a globalized supply chain. And most people would view the idea of modern slaves as being people chained to a desk somewhere, stitching jackets to the beat of a drum. And when it comes to sex trafficking victims, most people tend to envision what they've seen in the movies. The victim being a drug addicted, kidnapped girl chained to a radiator in a seedy basement. But in both these cases, the actuality is way more common and far more insidious. 
So why has this industry been allowed to grow to the level it has? And why is it these victims don't simply run away or demand a fair wage? Why is it that every year we see over a million convictions in the United States for gun and drug trafficking, but when it comes to human trafficking, an industry not that far off the size of the market cap of guns or drugs, yet the convictions are less than 0.5% of either of those industries, meaning that for every conviction done for human trafficking, there are over 200 for drugs, even though the size of these industries is relatively similar. So how do we get to this point? Well, to answer that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. An Industry Lacking Conviction there's some, a variety of definitions of, you know, human trafficking, modern slavery, people smuggling, people smugglers, um, you know, and, and in terms of, of our national jurisdiction, you know, there's, there's certainly um, legislation to define that. But really, the devil is in the detail on this one. You know, on one side, you can say, we can most definitely say that kids are kidnapped by people in balaclavas on some occasions. Um, but just as importantly, what we do see is an incredible cohort of people globally who are um, unsafe in its truest sense and desperate. The number of those people who are unsafe and desperate and vulnerable has significantly increased, certainly over COVID-19, so the last two and a half, three years. Uh, so what we also see is globally a demand for unskilled, cheap labour. John Coyne is the head of the Northern Australia Strategic Policy Centre and the Strategic Policing and Law Enforcement Division at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. John has worked inside intelligence in the Australian Federal Police for over 25 years, where he worked on transnational serious organised crime. He's an award-winning author who has published widely on policing and national security and conducted field research on Mexican organized crime, biosecurity, regional coast guards, and people smuggling. He's also a fantastic friend of this show, and we're very happy to have him back today. In pop culture, we see a lot of this, you know, like, um, you know, in pop culture, you know, there's the, that, that construction of the Asian prostitute who smuggled or the Eastern European prostitute who smuggled into the US or Europe or Australia. And, and held and, you know, they have no choice over um, who they see and what services they provide, et cetera. So that, that's a truism. But, you know, it, it's so significantly more than that. There's a growing awareness in, in uh, mainstream media that our supply chains, are, in some cases, are reliant on that. Uh, we've seen cases raised in China as an example. But we have things that are closer to home as well. So we've had cases here in Australia, in Melbourne, uh, you know, husband and wife keeping a, an elderly woman as a slave in a form of indentured labour. They were, they were successfully pro, uh, prosecuted for having slavery, um, having a modern day slave. That woman almost died of septicemia, so that's close to home. But also even at the industry level, we see our Australian agricultural industry uh, very much having a demand for cheap, unskilled labour. That demand can't be met at present in terms of things like the backpacker programs, but we've always had a long history of these precariously moved people who um, come into Australia working illegally, often in a form of indentured labour, by any definition would be considered modern slavery and i think this is the 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 insidious nature of this uh, we all want to believe that the world has moved on from slavery and trafficking and that this is a problem for for uh, non-western liberal democracies however we're all part of what is a incredibly global problem of um a, with incredibly vulnerable people and as a result of that, I don't think we can sit there and, and to your point, we can't just conceptualise this as, as an, is, an issue for the sex trade or an issue of balaclava wearing, child steering Eastern Europeans. One of the major troubles with human trafficking is that in many cases, the victims, at least in the beginning, come willingly, either thinking that they're heading overseas for a job or heading out with a friend of a friend or think that this is just a temporary arrangement to get them into the country. With so many of these people coming willingly through border checkpoints, for instance, how hard does it make it to identify or even prevent this at the beginning? I think you hit the nail on the head with this one. Um, 
And that is, is, is its nature is so difficult to look at and understand. I guess one issue or one component of this is the, is the issue of informed consent. So if someone is in an incredibly desperate situation, you know, and what I'm talking about here is, you know, uh, whether in, its, in a broad sense, human security. So if I'm sitting in a country like Myanmar where there's ongoing conflict and, you know, I can't get and make enough money to actually live and eat um, and I want to provide for my family, um, you know, I guess my point here is, is if I sign up to be trafficked somewhere or to be smuggled somewhere to undertake illegal labour, um, am I really making an informed decision about my well-being, and am I being treated in a fair and just manner? Now, another dimension of this is, and, and equally complex is, okay, um, person A has gone from, um, you know, been smuggled out of Afghanistan. Uh, they've signed up to do indentured labour. Their previous engagements with with the authorities has been one of oppression, violence. So. Are they really in Australia or in the US or in Europe then going to be comfortable to engage with law enforcement and regulatory public servants in some cases? And the other part about it is, is the whole aim of being uh, generally, of, of certainly willingly being trafficked for, for, um, for jobs or smuggled for jobs, um, an economic opportunity is ultimately your aim is to get as much money as possible, often to send it back to your family. So cooperating with government officials uh, would be counter to what you're trying to achieve and being sent home um, could me well mean the difference between your extended family being able to eat or not. So cooperation um, with law enforcement, it, it should be viewed through these lenses. Um, it requires a great deal of empathy for those people who, who've been involved in these sorts of offences and regulatory offences or criminal and regulatory offences. Uh, and I think from that perspective, it's why we have to keep a really, really open mind um, and certainly approach it from a moral and ethical perspective. Now, the other part about it is, is that in terms of secure supply chains, we as individuals and we as, um, in, as part of, of nations should be very much targeting this idea of, of, of introducing concepts of clean supply chains. So prevention is as important, if not more important, um, than prosecution in many cases. Removing slavery from people's supply chains has been one of the big pushes by a number of companies from several years now. But obviously with the international markets, companies are always trying to keep their production costs as low as possible. Whilst some companies have certificates to proclaim their supply chains are clean, other companies make products like the pen in my hand at the moment say made in Japan on them. And I know Japan has fairly robust workers' laws, so it's fairly unlikely that slaves built my pen in Japan. But how confident can we be in these factors of where it was made and certificates to verify the supply chain? Are these real guarantees or just marketing gimmicks? I guess what we can say is this. So for more than three decades, you know, we've been taught in um, our business schools and elsewhere about these some wonderful concepts around, um, and many of you will be sort of familiar with this, you know, globalisation, just-in-time supply chains, offshoring, centralisation of production. They're, they're wonderful business terms. Lean uh, manufacturing, lean thinking, um, you know, moving uh, manufacturing to places where uh, labour is cheaper. And, and that makes, from an economic sense, make sense. And, and for a long time, we were sort of happy with that being okay. I guess as early as the 1990s and 2000s, you know, there's that there's that concept of, you know, people used to talk about soccer balls being stitched in foreign countries by children, almost in a joking way as a picture of this. Well, the truth is, is, is that does still occur in supply chains. And when we talk about it, often we only think about it in the first layer. So we assume... Um, you know, take a, a pair of runners, or as many of our American and uh, European colleagues and listeners might say, a pair of sneakers. We assume that a pair of runners is manufactured in a plant, and as long as the people who are selling that into us um, are, you know, a well-known international brand, that they are doing the right thing, you know, they're, that their supply chain don't involve, you know, they're environmentally responsible, ethically responsible, they don't use slave labour, 
the challenge we have here is that those companies that make, say, a pair of runners, you know, all the little constituent parts are manufactured by a range of subcontractors. And the level of control amongst those subcontractors, the second and third level stages in the production process that sit behind the final assembly of a, of a, a runner, often those aren't particularly well regulated. And as a result of that, in those other stages, manufacturing can indeed involve the payment of individuals well below what would be described as acceptable. You know, we can we can feel relatively comfortable that we should be relatively uncomfortable, that we can be sure that just because a pen is marked as manufactured in Japan, that some other component of it hasn't been manufactured in another jurisdiction and that pen was only assembled in Japan. And that if that was the case, we can't always be sure that that's a, as it stands at the moment and as it stands in terms of us being able to um, apply traceability along supply chains, that we can understand that the whole supply chain itself is free from the impacts of um, modern slavery. So let's give an example here. Say you're a hypothetical sneaker company, a very well-established brand. Your shoes might be made in China, but labor in China isn't as cheap as it used to be. So already in 2022, more labor-intensive parts of the shoemaking process are outsourced. Companies years ago worked out that it would be cheaper to take, for instance, the cutting of the sole of the shoe, which is quite often done by hand, and produce that part of the shoe in Vietnam, where labor is cheaper, and then ship it to China to be finally assembled with the rest of the shoe. Your company may only save around 25 cents per shoe, but all of that adds up quickly when you're dealing with millions of shoes. See, most companies who build these shoes will mostly buy their parts from subcontractors who will send these companies thousands of parts to be finally manufactured and put together in China, which makes the final shoe. The metal grommets, the metal little O's that you put your laces through, for instance, are usually purchased from subcontractors in countries where labor is even cheaper than China's. So if you're a hypothetical shoe company and you have three companies offering to sell you grommets at 10 cents a piece, and one other company offering to sue you grommets at four cents a piece, choosing the cheap one could save you millions over the course of a year. And this is a pretty common scenario in the industries like these. So what incentives does a company, particularly a company who already has certification that there's no slavery taking place on their factory floor, have for taking a deep look into the manufacturing process of a subcontractor whose low prices could save them millions over the year? Is there a reason for a company to actually look really deeply into how a subcontractor runs their business when it could save them millions if they simply look the other way? Are there any laws to compel companies to actually look into this? Or frankly, at this level of manufacturing, this is where regulation tends to run out of steam. Look, increasingly we're seeing um, an expectation of traceability in supply chains. Now, where that's being applied in a couple of really different interesting ways. Um, so let's use, a, first off, a, a prime example of where, where it works as long as there's not corruption in the supply chain. Um, so the EU, in terms of timber products, is a really good example of this, uh, of, of how a supply chain can be regulated and controlled. So if today you and I walked into um, a furniture store in Stockholm and we decided to buy ourselves a wooden table or a wooden chair, we would be able to look at that product and we'd be able to find out exactly where that um, wood came from, where it was grown, and where it was um, where it was processed, etc. Uh, that put in place to make sure that supply chains for timber in Europe have are clean and don't involve illegal logging, which are very significant crime globally. Now um, that level of uh, traceability goes right back to the tree itself. So that, that's a really good example of, of how um, compliance and traceability can be legislated and regulated. Now, is it perfect? No, because you can have fraud still and corruption along your supply chain so that you know illegally logged timber finds its way into the supply chain. But in a general sense, it's a far better step forward. Now, there's a whole heap of really interesting work being done in trying to introduce that sort of um that sort of regulatory control into supply chains. And many companies are pioneering that, um, both because of the legislation, but also because of a commitment to modern slavery. But ultimately still, there is a huge profit imperative behind this. So 
uh, go more than three decades of MBA learning has said and taught um, managers, leaders, boards that offshoring and cheap to obtain cheap labour and economies of scale is okay to do. Um, and secondly, that lack of a really clear definition, uh, and, and we see a lot of this playing out. You know, um, you know, here in Australia, uh, there's a, there's a lot of arguments going. It wouldn't be possible for our agricultural some components of our agriculture or sector, especially in terms of fruit and vegetables, uh, for those to operate effectively um, without cheap labour. So uh, that's one of the challenges with all of this is, you know, uh, are we, um, and I, I mean that us as all of the listeners and you and I, Michael, um, are we willing to pay extra money for a product to be assured that that product hasn't had um, a child in the manufacturing process or someone who's in a form of indentured labour? Now, um, you know, th th that's the big question on this. So we want to have our cheap clothes and we want to have our cheap uh, electronics, but at the other end of it, we have to be willing to say, uh, we don't want them so cheap that, um, or we won't accept them being so cheap if that cheapness comes at the cost of, of people being enslaved or trafficked uh, inside countries or across borders. Human trafficking is a prolific industry, and it's estimated to be the third largest illegal market anywhere in the world, just behind drugs and guns. Yet last year in the US, 1.56 million people were arrested on drug offenses. But on human trafficking, the US bought less than 20 convictions. Why is it that such a large black market industry has such a minimal rate of convictions? The answer to that, like all of the world's prickly problems, um, is complex. But let's go through a few of the issues to, to really lay them out there. Um, first and foremost, um, whether you're in the US, the UK, Australia, uh, whether you're in Thailand, whether you're in Indonesia, or whether you're in the UAE, uh, there's a truism that I'll offer you, which is that the amount of reported crime far exceeds the capacity of law enforcement to respond. Secondly, um, the amount of unreported crime far exceeds the amount of reported crime. Uh, so, so number one is an issue of resources and prioritisation in terms of, of legal prosecutions. Um, you know, this is, this is a really tough space to prosecute in and certainly in an Australian context of proving an offence beyond reasonable doubt. Um, that, that's a really tough ask, especially when, generally speaking, uh, the witnesses, the victim, is quite often unwilling to cooperate with law enforcement. And that's not me victim blaming, um, because as I said earlier, I, I have a great deal of empathy and an understanding of why that's a difficult prospect for um, some victims. When you're in a system where resources are limited, where prosecutions are hard to achieve, uh, when you're looking at what's in the best interests, quite often, uh, um, police are forced to prioritise other offences that can be more easily proven and there's less chance of failure. So if prosecutions are so low and profits are so high and the businesses know that few people will ever dig far enough into their supply chains to uncover how they are keeping their prices so competitive, is there actually any way to stamp out labour trafficking without a major systemic overhaul and global regulation within the international supply chains? So, uh, yeah, you are right, you know, um, if you approach this from a purely competitive market-based approach and if you don't value the idea and the concept and, the, and a market doesn't value the idea and concept of, of clean um, labour supply chains, then that, that might be a problem. This is one of the biggest industries anywhere in the world. It brings in billions and billions of dollars yeah, the convictions are so incredibly low. And particularly when it comes to the sex trade, it crosses borders, cultures, languages, and jurisdictions. But being against sex trafficking is one of the only things I think that 99 out of 100 people in a room could actually agree on. So if it has bipartisan support, if it has everyone wanting to crack down on it, why are there so few convictions? Why is it that millions of people every year fall into this industry why do so few ever fully escape it? 
It's a very complicated series of questions, and to help us answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, a particular set of skills. So it's media-driven, sensationalized, movie line type of you know, rhetoric and imagery that we've been presented. And I think that's what most people think about when they think about human trafficking. It's far more complicated, far more ingrained, I think, in everyday attitudes, behaviors that actually go unnoticed. And, you know, I always like to bring up the movie Taken. Great movie and things like that do happen, but it's not mainly how it happens. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about, you know, the relationship even between traffickers and their victims. Um, a lot more familiarity between the two than one may, one may actually think. You know, imagery that you have of women sitting in a corner, prostitution-wise, prostitution which is what we typically think about when we think of human trafficking or the sex trade or commercial sex, um, you know, sitting in a corner with a mattress, you know, a dirty mattress, you know, half naked and with the red line sort of going back and forth. And that's not necessarily the what human trafficking is all about. Gabby DeBellis is a researcher and strategy advisor specializing in human trafficking, culture, law and policy. She also served as the chief co-editor of the St. Thomas University Intellectual Human Rights Law Review and has written the book Eradicating Human Trafficking, Culture, Law and Policy, specializing in policy and its implementation. We're thrilled to have her on the show today. So I think there's a lot of um, signs, too, that we don't see um, that, you know, a concept of, of, you know, coercion that is part of the elements of the crime is something we don't see. It's uh, uh, psychological coercion. Um, So we typically think of people, you know, chained up or beaten. And while that may exist in certain cases, it's not often the case. Um, In fact, the crime had to adapt to that psychological coercion. Um, which is a a very uh, distinct feature of how traffickers sort of keep a hold of their victims. Um, You know, the big question of why didn't they leave their circumstances? So um, it's a far more complicated, and there's a lot of myths and misconceptions that unfortunately tend to make the TikToks of the world. (laughs) Um, And, you know, abandoned buggies or, you know, shopping carts and abductions and parking lots and, and the white vans unmarked. And again, do all these things exist? Sure. But it's not what, you know, human trafficking is not, I think, what, what mostly we thought about, you know, even five, ten years ago. It's kind of a really bad question, but it's one that kept coming up in the research. From what a lot of the literature suggests, most victims of sex trafficking actually know their traffickers beforehand. That in most cases, it's an older friend or a boyfriend or a co-worker that actually talks them into it. If this is the case, though, and people do tend to know their traffickers quite well and are on friendly terms... How are so many women pressured into this industry? And why don't they just walk away when things get bad? So, yeah, I mean, look, survivors are, you know, and we, we want to term them as survivors, you know, but really people who are individuals who fall victim to the crime, like you mentioned, are often familiar with their traffickers. You know, traffickers obviously can be part of an organized, you know, crime group. Um, it can be individuals, um, you know, but traffickers can also include family members. They can include parents, romantic partners, close acquaintances, like people would never think of a neighbor or a family friend. Um, you know, there's a, a great organization here in the U.S. It's called National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And they've done an amazing job of kind of putting together this graph that um, looks at particularly the relationship of the offender to the child in terms of images and videos online that are, you know, let's say in the in the commercial exploitation of children. Um, And it's astonishing to see how, you know, things like, you know, that relationship could be like the unknown to the the, the trafficker that's either unknown to the child, somebody completely, let's say a stranger, um, the online grooming that, you know, we're hearing a lot about in terms of, you know, preventing the crime for for kids online and, and a lot of the training that's happening, um, those that 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 wheel part or that percentage on that full wheel that they note or this graph is significantly lower than what we would expect. The majority of that wheel is comprised of, for example, the the guardian, the child's guardian, the a neighbor, a family friend, a parent, um, other relatives. So 
it, it's a lot more familiar um, than we think. There's there's these promises, these false expectations um, of let's say somebody who is facing some economic economic challenges in their country of origin, and they're looking for better opportunities abroad. Well, what about when you have to cross borders with victims trafficked from one country to another? Crossing of borders is not necessary for the crime to occur. So human trafficking, people always think of movement, and that can happen in your own state, in your own backyard. Uh, um, so, but when it comes to looking for opportunities, whether you know internal or abroad, there's these false expectations, and traffickers are very savvy. They're promised, you know, victims are promised with you know great pay, great opportunities. Um, oftentimes, there are legal ways to get some of these potential victims abroad um, through visas, temporary work visas. Um, but once they reach, the, you know, individuals reach that destination, um, what they may encounter is, you know, the false sense of what they were promised. Their, you know, documents could be taken away, which means now you may be in a new country without a language, not knowing where you are, not knowing where the resources or where you can go to for help. And potentially your documents, your travel documents, your ID, your passport, everything's taken away from you. So now you have this sort of shady story and you're a foreign national in another country, for example, and who do you go to? So that type of, of, of challenge is very real in terms of you know, you may know who recruit, recruited you. It may be a friend who got you into this position and who may be either involved or even made to traffic you as part of her or his trafficking situation. Um, so that's why you have a lot of this familiarity between trafficker and victim. Um, and in terms of, you know, conviction or identifying the, you know, the crime, uh, I mean, it's it's nefarious at nature, right? So by nature, it challenges the rule of law. It's always going to look at how to get around being detected, if so, if you will. So, and, and traffickers are very savvy. They know how to do this. And I'm sure you maybe have heard of this this concept, but, you know, the crime has been known for being sort of a high reward, low risk in terms of getting caught and much less convicted. So it kind of pays to traffic, um, you know, and traffickers prey on fear and, you know, vulnerability of their victims. Um, and they know what buttons to push so that, you know, leaving their situations, it, you know, is going to be very hard for them. Uh, much less exposed in their traffickers. Um, let's say, like you mentioned, United Airport, um, it's very, very unlikely that that will happen. So obviously there are signs, there's a lot more awareness that's now happening with, you know, within the private sector, for example, airlines, you know, uh, hotels, any kind of participatory entity around trafficking situations. Um, but it's, it's really sort of it's hard because you're talking about, you know, traffickers, like I said, they know how to navigate. Um, and it's also a combination of getting victims to come forward. And first of all, that means to self-identify as a victim, uh, which is often very hard or just not even something that victims see that they're being trafficked. So to denounce a trafficker and then on top of it, con you know, cooperate in the investigation, including potential testimony against their trafficker, that's extremely hard to do. I mean, you think about the the impact that this crime has on a person, especially if they were vulnerable prior to them being trafficked, now you have this trauma. Um, if it's you know sex trafficking or labor trafficking or other, you have the shame, you know, uh, additional vulnerability around your circumstances, possibly fear and threats that they'll be you know further contacted or worse, you know, threatened by their their traffickers that they would you know hurt their families or or what have you. So you know, and some of these victims also you know are. Tr are battle with sort of trauma bonding, which further complicates, you know, their recovery or their ability to get help and help expose their traffickers. But how big a problem is this industry, though? Last year, 10 times more people were convicted of stealing dogs than there were convictions for human trafficking. So do you think that's an indication of the fact this industry is a lot smaller than we might think it is? Or is it just the conviction rate is so appallingly low that 10 times more people are arrested for kidnapping dogs than they are for human trafficking. You know, you have, like you mentioned, a very small percentage of cases that get prosecuted, and then even less of that get convicted. Um, so even those who get convicted still face really small penalties, back to that sort of high risk, low, or high reward, low risk um, environment that I was talking about. So the cycle just continues, at least from that standpoint. And we have laws, I mean, they've been in generally, uh, in general, in place since, let's say, the early 2000s, um, you know, and it varies. Of course, we have a sort of a, a international sort of guideline, which is the, what we term as the Palermo Protocol um, under the UN. And then, of course, we have each nation state, you know, country, region, 
um, what have you, will have their, their own laws domestically. But the convictions have still been, you know, worldwide pretty dismal. And I think we're now slowly starting to see that number increase. And I think it's all connected to, for example, you know, awareness and support of survivors, which is a big thing. Um, awareness of, you know, number one, what the crime is, to properly provide services to detect the crime um, and identify survivors for what they are versus thinking of them as criminals, you know, giving them the proper support and resources to self-identify, to come forward, to help them navigate the criminal justice systems and, you know, whatever response, you know, there, there may be at. So, you know, oftentimes we, we think of, you know, again, going back to identifying, let's say, a, what the crime looks like or what a victim may look like. And oftentimes they're hidden behind cultural elements such as let's layer in migratory issues, you know, where victims are often deported instead of being processed under, you know, protection, you know, visas or, 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 or legislation that may be there to, to help them uh, navigate, you know, it's an illegal immigrant, let's say, with no resources and a shady story. Like we talked about when you're kind of caught abroad it, with that false sense of, of promises that you have from your trafficker. In other parts of the world, you may see this in the context of children being forced to beg or sell goods to make their quota. And at times, children are even maimed to make it visually easier to um, exploit or appeal to, you know, potential donors in the street. But what we see perhaps culturally is we think of a, a con artist or a thief or a pickpocket, and we don't know what the story behind that may be. So in a sense, we're kind of contributing to hide the crime, right? Prostitution, the same, you know, blur, let's say, would happen where, and I certainly don't argue whether it's right or wrong in terms of, you know, uh, sex work. So that's not what my research will focus on. But for example, we look at a sex worker, maybe out in the streets, you know, soliciting, and well, the reality is that they are being, you know, perhaps forced to do or coerced to doing what they're doing. But when, let's say, a raid sets in, a lot of times a prostitute or a commercial sex worker may not be uh, either self-identifying as a victim or they wouldn't even want to come forward and self-identify for fear of what their trafficker would do and instead is facing, you know, themselves criminal charges for prostitution. So a lot of times these sort of cultural blinders, you know, may not even allow us to see let's say, situation as they happen within our own cultures. And, you know, and traffickers know that, you know, they know they can get away with that. They have a, a very good sense of what will keep sort of victims in that fear state to not um, to not face any penalties. Uh, but when it comes to, like you said, you know, it is absolutely scratching the surface. And I'm sure we're familiar with sort of, you know, the magnitude or the scale of, of what human trafficking is. And it's a, it's a global pro, uh, you know, problem. It's it's a crime that spans across every inch of, of the world. And I know we've heard some of the estimates, you know, the data that comes out that we hear, the 40 million figure that we often uh, hear about and the 21 plus million. And that number actually comes from the International Labor Organization. Uh, but I like to break it down. But like, what does that mean? Right. So we hear this 40 million, which is pretty massive. First of all, th those are estimates. So the, the, the number is likely a lot higher than that. Um, and this is what potentially gets identified or reported. So imagine we talked about all that fear, um, you know, with victims, uh, what goes unnoticed. So we can only imagine what that what that really looks like. So the 40 million is is actually most of it is made up of labor trafficking. So about 21 million or so. And again, these are estimates and these are now quite a few years you know, ago. Um, so mostly, you know, let's say 50 percent of that or so of that 40 million. Um, focuses on labor trafficking, and about 60 million of that is in the private sector. So, pretty hard to detect. So, you're talking about, you know, anywhere from domestic work, um, you know, construction, agriculture, and other industries. Um, and that number also includes child labor, um, which also includes, you know, dead bondage or servitude by children. Um, and then you have, you know, forced labor imposed by state authorities, and that makes up, you know, the rest of whatever four million of that of that twenty or twenty one million. And then you have another, you know, four plus million, and that's now we're talking about eleven percent or so. That is sex trafficking or forced sexual exploitation, which we hear a lot about. So, you know, you can see the difference in that. You know, we often hear about sex trafficking. Rightly so, you know, on the news, on the media, on on stories, on 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 testimonies, but the the twenty one million that we just talked about in terms of labor trafficking, we don't even hear that much. Now it's starting to pick up a little bit more about let's focus on labor trafficking, and these are not mutually exclusive. So I mean, that could be kind of across the board of, of all of these. So if you look at that percentage of of you know convicted cases, I mean, it's it's absolutely nothing compared to this again 
massive estimate number that we see of, of victims out there. Well, even taking the small amount of convictions, let's look at what has been successful. At the moment, what are the best ways for catching and convicting these human traffickers? And can we expand on these methods to catch more people? Technology has been able to help us track, let's say, traffickers' paths on the web or specific sort of patterns or algorithms that we can help law enforcement pin down where these, you know, traffickers or, or rings are. In one example, and there's a, a few other ones, but, you know, Marinus, Marinus Analytics have a, a product traffic jam that has helped law enforcement track a lot of these sort of scenarios. But if you think, you know, traffickers often also use banks to launder earnings. So they deposit large amounts of cash. For example, the banking system has now really started to conduct, let's say, deeper investigations via anti-money laundering teams that can help identify suspicion, suspicious financial activity or transactions that may alert to possible human trafficking and even smuggling situations. So financial institutions, um, and I know Citibank has done a great job at this too, but they'll red flag certain activities that could signal suspicious you know, transactional history, a profile that's maybe worth reporting to assist law enforcement and you know, targeting again a potential human smuggling or, or trafficking situations. And then traffickers, the way that they let's say book, uh, and I'm thinking maybe sex trafficking here, you know, they'll leave a trail in terms of booking, let's say multiple hotel rooms, like a room block, um, you know, rides, if you think here in the U.S., Uber. So it's, it's, it's something that, you know, can also be used to track, I guess, you know, patterns and, and behaviors around, you know, certain events or key areas that are suspected of, of, of um, sort of hosting, you know, trafficking um, instances. Um, and traffickers have also turned to, I'm sure, you know, we've heard of this, you know, to cryptocurrency, which of course leaves some sort of trail history. Again, I think a lot of these um, ways are, are starting to really surface now, especially with the use of technology and AI to kind of help track some of these situations. So I'm, I'm a big sort of fan of, of how technology can come in, even though it's used to, you know, by traffic to groom, uh, you know, victims, it can also be, let's say, used for the good, right? So they're actually being, it's being very helpful in terms of, of helping us track down traffickers and, and, and come down with where the rings may be originating from and so forth. I think one of the other major problems here is with reintegration. Even if we do manage to catch a trafficker on other charges like money laundering or illegal gambling and then set the survivors free, we don't do a lot for the people we've actually freed. And listening to a lot of survivors' testimonies in the research for this piece, we heard a lot of them come forward saying that they didn't want to go public with all this as they didn't want the stigma around them forever being known as a sex trafficking survivor. A lot of these survivors also came out with things like bad teeth in particular as their captors had not looked after their teeth whilst in captivity. And when they do leave, they have no source of income and they have no way to fix them. We kind of just expect these women to be set free on the Monday and then be employed and going on like nothing happened on a Wednesday. But is there a way to actually fix this problem? Encourage women to actually be able to get on a stable foot so they can testify and they can actually bring convictions for these people? That's a great question because I one of the things that I'm very sensitive about is listening to survivors that, you know, especially if you've if you come through the journey and you're now uh, incredibly brave to sort of come back and, you know, help others, you know, exit, so to speak, and help create better systems. And we've come a long way, but there's still a lot more to go in terms of what services we can provide. Um, with more awareness of the crime also comes, you know, better understanding of what survivors endure. You know, that said, you know, a lot of some parts of the world still face a, a significant amount of uh, social stigma, you know, shame um, and things like that. And we may indirectly be contributing to that stigma with misconceptions. Right. So I think I mentioned it earlier, but why didn't they just leave, you know, their circumstances when we talked about that psychological coercion, which is an incredibly strong barriers for survivors to overcome. And it's not that psychological coercion may not just be. A human trafficking trait, I think we, you know, if we think of domestic violence, I mean, again, we may see some high profile, unbeknownst to us, you know, person stuck in this domestic abuse case, and we think, why didn't they just leave? You know, there's there's trauma bonding that's also involved, and that that's very much the case here in, in human trafficking as well. You know, in addition, some of the services offered to, to survivors uh, at times only deal with, let's say, immediate relief for survivors. So, you know, the moment you get out or, you know, and I want to say, I think we're empowering survivors to be able to find 
you know, a better journey. Uh, because this concept of rescuing survivors, it just sounds like we're, you know, picking up puppies on the side of the road. So we're really kind of enabling a better journey for them. I mean, they've endured a significant amount of trauma, which, like you said, doesn't just go away after getting a job and a safe place to live. It's a, a lot more and a lot deeper than that. And it's about having patience through their journey and compassion that the healing is just not always going to be linear. And it's going to vary by person, which highlights, right, the importance of tailoring a reintegration path for each survivors. And then legally, you know, also dealing with things like confidentiality issues, you know, such as helping to expunge records and, you know, maybe keep certain personal data about the survivor's journey from becoming public record. Um, and this ties back to, to stigma and to trauma. So I think we've come a long way. There's a lot more that we can do. And, you know, we sort of celebrate you know, other instances when, you know, they return home, this can, this should be looked at the same way. You know, the survivor is an incredibly resilient person that we should, we should really have a lot of admiration for, for the journey, for what they've overcome and, and what they still, you know, are working to face, you know, day after day. So for the people who are listening to the program at the moment, are there ways that people can identify potential victims of sex trafficking? Are there telltale signs we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, so that's a great area to talk about, like, you know, how to, how to identify someone, um, you know, a, a trafficking victim. One thing that I, I, I just popped into my head is also look at the recent headline from Sir Mo Farah's stories, right? So he was, you know, about being trafficked as a child in the UK. Does he look like a human trafficking victim? I mean, this guy's an Olympic medalist, you know, so it really tells you the vulnerabilities and the fears that, you know, children migrants and overall people face about, you know, whether coming forward and, you know, when they're being trafficked and potentially what their story's like. Recognizing someone being trafficked is, you know, that's where I think we need to reshape a little bit about our conceived ideas of what victims and survivors look like. I think we talked about, you know, that imagery that we're presented with, right? Um, so yes, there's some physical and behavioral manifestations, but it's really very individualized. And it's not just sex trafficking, there's labor trafficking, um, child marriages, and there's, you know, organ trafficking as well. And that's highly under under detected. But some indicators, and I know that there's a lot of organizations that put out some some really good resources. I know here the U.S. State Department has a, a good list to reference, you know, and potentially some even good questions to ask of somebody who you think or suspect may be a potential victim. But some of these indicators can include, let's say, you know, poor living conditions, sometimes dismal conditions maybe even living with the employer who may have, again, seized their travel or ID documents. Um, you know, they may not speak the language um, or very poorly so. They're rarely alone. Um, they may always be, you know, sort of watched or accompanied and much less maybe even able to speak alone to anyone. They may, of course, like I said, you know, physical abuse is, is and could be present not paid at all or paid very little to survive. They often appear very scripted with their stories or their answers. Um, and you have that feeling that something's just not quite right. Sometimes they're very fearful, especially if they're, you know, foreign national, they're very fearful of authorities, law enforcement, um, and they could be very overly, let's say, submissive. And I think one of the important things is if you suspect something, and sometimes, you know, it's looking at a young girl with you know, an older guy or um, somebody who looks like they are unfortunately in a sort of economically disadvantaged position, sort of being, you know, led to and from without much care for the person. Um, you know, we're talking about, of course, labor trafficking. But the best thing you can do is is to offer, I think, support and resources. If there's a hotline from where you are, um, um, and you yourself can also report if you have a hotline um, where you're at um, to report a tip of, you know, maybe you suspect something uh, to the authorities or an organization in your area. Local organizations are a great way to also get involved, um, you know, offer support and get some training or get some um, some resources to, to post up. I think I mentioned, you know, a lot of victims are often not alone. So uh, a lot of organizations, a lot of organizations will focus, for example, if putting a lot of these tips or, or hotlines um, and resources on bathroom stalls where they're often, you know, alone uh, for a few minutes. Um, training of professionals like medical professionals is so key. Hotels, how to spot potential trafficking situations, airlines. But the most important thing too is, is if you're not trained to do so or versed in what to do, um, you know, is, is really not go in and try to sort of save them, you know, save somebody from trafficking because it really 
it can turn a situation for the worse, right? And especially if that person is not ready to leave their circumstances. So again, offering, you know, support, you know, resources, someone to talk about if you have the opportunity, a tip, um, where to go for help and, and you know, reporting it. I think those are the, the best things you, you can do. So is this something the government can do here to end this most heinous of industries? And which branch of government should be assigned the task? Should it be up to the local police to catch these guys? Well, the local police have very limited funds, so usually decide to go after guns or drugs, knowing the convictions are usually a lot easier to attain. Well, should the governments write stricter rules on this? Well, this is a pretty difficult industry to regulate, as banning things like people coming from overseas or selling sex is likely just going to push it further underground with less scrutiny and less safety. Well, is it an issue for multinational law enforcement then? With outfits like Interpol who can chase suspects across borders. These sort of organizations seem perfect for these sort of operations. But when you're so high up, you often miss the nuance on the ground. So what can actually be done? And who should be tasked with breaking up this awful industry? Well, to answer that, we turn to our final guest. Part 3. Labor Pains That's the view that Hollywood has created. That's the view that the movie Taken has created. And it has done so much harm to actual efforts to try and combat human trafficking because about three quarters of the trafficking and servitude around the world is forced labor outside commercial sex. Only about 25% is within commercial sex, according to the ILO. And so people have focused myopically on sex trafficking, which is absolutely horrendous and must be combated. But people have ignored the labor trafficking, which is ubiquitous around the world. And you know, what my colleagues and I will often say that forced labor is a feature and not a bug of global employment systems, global uh, treatment of workers. Martina Vandenberg is the founder and president of the Human Trafficking Legal Center. Vandenberg has spent two decades fighting human trafficking, forced labor, rape as a war crime, and violence against women. She's represented victims of human trafficking pro bono and has testified before the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Human Rights and the Law, the Helsinki Commission, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee on an array of human rights issues. A former Human Rights Watch ambassador as well, Vandenberg spearheaded investigations into human rights violations in the Russian Federation, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Uzbekistan, Kosovo, Israel, and Ukraine. And she's the author of two human rights reports, including Hopes Betrayed, Trafficking of Women and Girls to Post-Conflict Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we're thrilled to have her on the show today. The focus has caused us essentially to attach ourselves to an, a, a very limited set of remedies. The main one being criminal prosecution. And what we have learned in the 22 years since the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, the US law passed, and in the 20 years since the Palermo Protocol, the international treaty that bans trafficking, what we have learned is that that very, very limited remedy is not working. And we need to rethink our approach to combating human trafficking and forced labor and sex trafficking entirely. Well, let's talk about slavery and supply chains first. And under advice from our legal team, I'm not going to name names here, but it is a shoe company who came under fire a few years ago for having children as indentured servants being used in their supply chains to make the shoes. Once the media backlash became too great, they decided to try and repair their image by running an audit of their supply chain, looking for slavery and removing it. And whilst a lot of the media clapped, what they instead did was fire most of their workers in China, Vietnam, India, and Bangladesh, and only kept on a handful of staff, mostly the admin and logistics people. They moved these admin staff into a small office, and then the corporation started another company in each of these countries. Shu Corp India, Shu Corp China, Shu Corp Vietnam, Shu Corp Bangladesh kind of stuff. They then sold their warehouse and gave off the workers to that small company for just a dollar. That small company actually makes the shoes, and then the international corporation buys those shoes from the small company. With that all in place, they now have someone come to certify that their small office building with admin staff has no slavery. So someone comes in and gives them the thumbs up, 
that none of the Abandon people are slaves, and there are no slaves working in this small office. And so the company pats itself on the back and says, we've removed slavery from our supply chains, and we know that everyone working for us in this country is absolutely 100% legal, as the people working for the corporation in that country are just a handful of admin staff. The indentured servants working and the people manufacturing these shoes are still in the same warehouse, still making the same shoes, still going to the same people with the same distributors. The difference is just the nameplate on the wall. And the company pats itself on the back until they're caught again, and when they were, they just restarted the whole process, simply putting another layer of cooperation between themselves and the subcontractors who make the shoes. So when a company tells us they have a clean supply chain and they have the certificates to prove it, can we really take that as complete gospel? Absolutely not. I think the certificates are by and large nearly meaningless because most companies have not looked deeply into their supply chains. Most companies prefer to bury their heads in the sand and pretend like they don't know who their sub suppliers and their subcontractors are. And so they might have looked down one tier, maybe two tiers, but they're not looking deeply into their supply chains. You know, as a lawyer, I used to work on corruption issues and we would represent companies that were accused of bribery. And when an allegation of bribery came into the C-suite, the corporation would react immediately. It would go to the board of directors. It would go to the CEO. There would immediately be an investigation, an internal investigation to determine who paid the bribe and who knew. And more often than not, the person paying the bribe and those people who knew about the bribe would be immediately fired. Contrast the treatment of bribery with the treatment of allegations of forced labor. When there are allegations of forced labor, companies go into PR defense mode. This is a question that they punt over to their public relations team rather than drilling down to try and determine whether there actually is forced labor in their supply chain. And what we have is a complete lack of accountability. It's unfortunate because consumers aren't holding corporations accountable for eliminating forced labor in their supply chains. States are definitely not holding corporations accountable for, for forced labor in the supply chains. I mean, the United States government has never prosecuted, not a single case, never prosecuted a corporation for forced labor in an extraterritorial supply chain, a supply chain outside the United States. So there is no accountability. Corporations know that they have impunity. And the only thing that they actually understand is risk. The only thing that they will respond to is risk. And so on the corporate side, which is a little bit different than the individual side, which we can also talk about, but on the corporate side, the prosecution imperative actually is important. It's not, it's, it's not proper just to look at consumers and say that just consumers have to force corporations to, to change their behavior. Consumers play an important role, but consumers are not going to have the kind of leverage on corporations that governments will if governments actually choose to start holding these corporations accountable. And the last thing I'll say on this is we have had moments for insight about forced labor when it look when we when we look at what's happening with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang because the US Congress passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act which creates a rebuttable presumption that all goods coming from Xinjiang all goods coming from the Uyghur region are made with forced labor. And those goods are no longer allowed in the United States. And the corporations who, by the way, have known about the concentration camps and the genocide of the Uyghurs and have known that the Department of Treasury has put out lists of companies owned by the XPCC, the Communist Party business sort of entity that, that, that runs many of, these, uh, many of these companies in Xinjiang. Companies have been on notice for years. But when the deadline came for enforcement of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in January of 2022, there was disarray and concern that they hadn't had time to examine their supply chains to determine whether they had cotton or other goods from Xinjiang lurking in their supply chains. And I have to say, the time for patience has ended and the time for prosecution has begun.
So why haven't there been these convictions if laws aren't being passed? There are millions of arrests every year for guns and drugs. Why is this particular crime always seem to go under everyone's radar? On the forced labor side of the house, I think it's a complete lack of political will. And just to put some numbers into the mix, the State Department comes out with a report on human trafficking every year. It's the Trafficking in Porsons Report. It covers more than 180 countries around the world, and every country's policies and practices and prosecutions are examined, and the State Department collects data from all countries around the globe about how many prosecutions they've done. And you know, keeping in mind that the number of people who are believed to be held in all forms of of uh, human trafficking and servitude and forced labor, including that in the commercial sex industry. Uh, it's about 25 million people around the globe. Now, in the entire world in 2021, the State Department reports that there were just 10,572 prosecutions in the entire world, with just 5,260 convictions in the entire world. And that's, that's looking at the aggregated figures. When you get to the figures for prosecutions of forced labor, that's when complete despair enters the picture. Because in 2021, according to the State Department's estimates, there were 1,379 prosecutions for forced labor in the entire world. And if you do the math, that's one prosecution for every 14,576 victims that the ILO estimates are held in forced labor outside the sex industry. That is an appalling number. So you've asked me the question, why? Why are there so few prosecutions? I think there are very few resources devoted to this. I think there is very little political will. And I think if you ask the US government themselves, they would admit that they are failing on this. And it's it's not just prosecution of corporations for forced labor. It's also prosecution of individuals for forced labor. And in the entire United States, all of the federal prosecutors, both at the main Department of Justice and at all of the U.S. attorney's offices around the United States, in 2021, they prosecuted a total of seven forced labor cases. Seven in an entire year in the entire country. And it is not the case that there are no victims of forced labor here in the United States. There absolutely are victims of forced labor here in the United States. And they are not able to convince prosecutors to prosecute their cases. I cannot tell you how many cases we have taken to authorities where the authorities have simply declined to prosecute. Look, I understand that it is much harder to attain a conviction with this kind of crime but why are they refusing to prosecute? Why not go after it if people are coming to them with the information they would need to actually pursue a conviction? And does this lack of pursuit attain to just labor trafficking or does it also attain to the sex trafficking industry? Sex trafficking cases are easier to prosecute if the victim is a child. Because if it's a sex trafficking case in the United States where the victim is under 18, you only have to prove that there was a commercial sex act and that the person was under 18. If you have a case of an adult and you have to prove that there was force or coercion, right? Because that's the standard. You have to be able to prove that there was force or coercion in order to keep someone in a situation of involuntary servitude or forced labor. You know, admittedly, that is harder. But just to give you a sense of the contrast that we have here, trafficking survivors can bring their own cases in the U.S. courts. and. We use, as civil lawyers, exactly the same set of laws that federal prosecutors use. It's exactly the same laws. And just to give a sense of the contrast between the cases that federal authorities are bringing and the cases that victims are bringing themselves in the federal courts, uh, the U.S. government brought seven cases of forced labor in 2021. Victims themselves brought 37 cases of forced labor using exactly the same statutes. And I think we need to pause for a moment and just admit how hard it is for a trafficking victim who's been held in forced labor, number one, to escape, 
Number two, to become sufficiently stable that they can find a lawyer, to find a lawyer and then have a lawyer file a case in federal court alleging forced labor. So the fact that 37 people were able to do that is, is pretty remarkable. And, and it's certainly more than the federal government has done. Governments have done some work to prosecute sex trafficking over the years, but usually do it quite haphazardly, with most countries either choosing to further vet people coming into the country or cracking down on prostitution, which in turn simply just increase the prevalence of people smugglers. And for the latter, force women working in brothels with health checks and STD checks and security and safe working conditions to go back to working on the streets. In your experience, is there any legislation or a law a government could pass that could actually effectively combat this industry? We have been focused for too long on the people who are drowning in the river. We need to go upstream and find out why people are falling into the river. And I didn't make up that phrase. Uh, that was uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu who said that first. Looking upstream on the forced labor side, what we would find is that we need to tackle structural issues. We need to stop playing whack-a-mole with prosecutions on the side of the river where people are already drowning. If we went upstream and looked at things like wage theft, wage theft is an early warning sign of human trafficking. If organizations and employers can get away with wage theft, then they've already dipped their toe into exploitation and it's just a hop, skip and a jump to get to actual forced labor. And so we need to have actual labor inspectors who are monitoring whether or not people are getting paid. There is a paper trail, right? There is a paper trail of money that was supposed to be paid to the workers and either it got there or it didn't. And the question is, where did the money end up? This particular issue is also very prevalent here in Australia, particularly out in the rural parts of the country. To give a real example, if you're a person who comes over on a visa, hoping to establish permanent residency to eventually become a citizen, you may come over on a visa hired by a company or a farm who offers to hire you at minimum wage. But once you arrive in the country, hoping to start your job being paid minimum wage, the farm then charges you a fee to either rent the equipment you use or charges you a fee for the housing you live in, but also forces you to live in the shack that they own. Which means that the workers in most cases end up working for little or even nothing. And since their visa is tied to that employer, if they walk away, they'll be immediately deported and unable to return to the country. So one of two things happen. Either they walk away and they get deported, and then they're unable to bring the case against their employer anyway, or they bring it to the authorities. But instead of this being a police issue, these cases are referred to workplace regulators and ombudsmen, all of which have had their funding gouged away a year after year by a number of governments. So even if they do manage to have their case heard by one of these regulators, they often take ages to get through their backlog to arrive at your case. And by the time they do arrive at your case, you may have been forced out of the country and unable to actually testify about it, or they may be too under-resourced to properly pursue it, simply making two or three phone calls and saying, well, we don't really have a case here. And even if you did manage to work for virtually nothing for almost an entire year, you maintained your visa and you gave the ombudsman enough evidence to attain a conviction, it's a labor board, which means it's pretty toothless. On the odd occasion they do actually achieve a conviction, most of the time the employer just has to pay back some or all of the missing wages or just make up the difference. And few ever pay interest or receive jail time. The bigger farms in particular will also regularly use their money to file appeal after appeal after appeal, which as someone who's earned virtually nothing for years, you rarely have the money to fight. And they'll continue to do this until you're eventually inevitably forced to give up and drop the case. So if there's so little risk to these larger companies or farms of actually being convicted, and the worst case scenario is often paying back the money they would have paid you in the first place anyway, what incentive do they actually have to abide by the labor rules rather than exploiting human trafficking for profit? I could not agree with you more, but governments are making choices, right? It is a policy decision to make those organizations toothless. It is a policy decision to underfund those organizations. And it would be a policy decision to make them powerful. 
So it's very important for those corporations, those companies that are so abusing their workers to have to disgorge all of that money and pay the workers everything that they are owed and also pay them interest or pay them liquidated damages to uh, apologize in a sense, to make up for the time lag uh, between the time when they should have been paid and the time that the remedy is actually coughed up. I'm very troubled though by this idea that companies basically get a slap on the wrist and they just have to sort of pay the wages and pay those back. And that for them, that's just a cost of doing business, right? That's a kind of no harm, no foul approach. And companies need to be punished for this because it is not acceptable to engage in to engage in wage theft. And and looking at governments, it is not acceptable to allow this to happen because that's a policy decision, not an accident. Even if the United States or Australia were to get the most pro-worker government that ever had, that doesn't really change anything in Vietnam or Bangladesh, does it? Even if we were to pursue and change these laws, surely all that does is move the problem from one country to another where the laws aren't as strict. Absolutely correct. But recently, because of amendments to the Tariff Act of 1930, we are able now to petition the U.S. government, to petition the Customs Service here in the United States to block goods from entering the U.S. market if we can show that they are made in whole or in part with forced labor. And this is probably one of the most powerful remedies that we have seen since the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000 here in the United States. This remedy last year alone blocked 1,469 shipments of goods worth approximately $486 million from entering the United States. The Tariff Act import ban section has forced companies to sit up and take notice because now there is a significant risk that if their goods are made with forced labor in whole or in part, that those goods will be blocked at a U.S. port. Keeping in mind, the goods that are blocked from entering the U.S. market can be simply turned around and transshipped to another labor market for sale. And so import bans in one country, not, not so useful. Import bans in all of the G7 countries, that would be incredibly powerful, even more powerful than what we're seeing with the import ban in the United States. These are very well-funded industries you're going up against in a number of countries who regularly lobby for influence. How likely is it that a ban would actually ever happen or a ban that could actually be enforced? One that doesn't just ban the admin company from being able to do business, but also the subcontractors who actually make the product. It is a long way from being solved, but I have hope because I watched the evolution of the prohibition on bribery. You know, in the 70s, bribery was ubiquitous. In the 1970s, bribery was tax deductible in Germany. You could deduct it from your business taxes if you paid a bribe. So fast forward now to 2022, we need to get to the place on forced labor where we are on bribery. It needs to be totally prohibited, just as bribery is totally prohibited. And, you know, I hear echoes of companies' excuses for bribery now in their excuses for forced labor. We didn't know, they might say. Our business development associate, who, who we didn't control in that country, they paid the bribe. We didn't pay the bribe. Our consultant paid the bribe. It's not on us. And so we need companies now to take the responsibility to look into their supply chains, look deeply into their supply chains, and see if there is forced labor. Even if that is, like Nestle, forced labor in the cocoa that is commingled into the cocoa that they're buying. Domestic workers around the globe are some of the most vulnerable people because they are literally locked in their workplace if they are trafficked. They cannot go out. They don't have contact with the outside world. They have very little means of escape and they literally live with the people who are holding them in forced labor. We saw how horrendous this can be when the BBC put out a, an investigative report in 2019 showing that in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and several other countries in the Gulf, 
employers, citizens of those countries, were actually selling domestic workers as chattel on apps like Instagram, selling people as slaves in the 21st century. This is shocking. And as far as I can see, after the BBC investigative report came out, no one was held accountable. Not the people who were clearly selling human beings on an app in the Gulf, and not those apps themselves. And so we live in a system now where everyone gets to duck accountability and workers bear the brunt of these structural defects, these features, not bugs, in the global employment system. We are looking at a completely broken system and it needs to be overhauled from the ground up. So, what can be done? If we take a look at the first obvious one, and we try and inspect businesses, and make sure there's no forced labor anywhere in their supply chain, all they will do is add a layer of corporate separation to it. And even if we were to take the time and political effort, working with multiple national governments, in various sectors to put regulations in to go after that added layer, they'll simply just move it to another country that we haven't legislated for yet. Even when this is happening on our own sovereign territory, we can't do much, as most of these workers might be here on business tied visas or desperately need this job to be able to send some money back home through remittances. So in many cases, they don't even bring it up to the authorities. And even if they did want to pursue these, those authorities have been stretched so thin by various governments that unless the case is served to them on a practical silver platter with a confession in hand, it's unlikely to be convicted as it will get minimum work or simply fall in the too hard to do basket. As after years of undermining, these organizations don't have the staff to conduct month long investigations and fight the armies of lawyers objecting to people looking through their records. So they go after the easy cases to that a lack of any real risk of actually being convicted and this almost seems like just best business practice for these employers but while seeking profit over people may come down to some people's individual beliefs you would think that trying to eliminate sex trafficking would be in the interest of everybody but that's where it gets complicated as how do you achieve that see most of these victims either come into it willingly or are duped by someone they trusted, or simply because they know that as much as they may not like it, it is helping bring money to their family back home. And I really don't want to come across as victim blaming. I just want to put across how complicated this industry is. A lot of these victims also get trapped in a vicious cycle, where they're now stuck in a foreign country with invalid papers, not speaking the language, and with no money. And they know if they go to the police, many of which regularly testify that the police have been using their services, they may not be believed or be able to explain what was going on due to the language barrier. And they know, or at least they're told, that even if there were an investigation, that may take months before anything even happens. And quite a lot of these victims really have nowhere else to go apart from the trafficker's accommodation. On top of that, the trafficker might also have threatened them, told them they'll hurt their friends or colleagues that they also work with if anyone was to go forward to the police. Even on a personal level, you may have been told that if you were to come forward, everyone will shun you, particularly if you've come from a religious house or religious family, that your friends and family would never look at you the same again. And you have to weigh up all of this, knowing that the people who do come forward and try to escape this industry are expected to do so by coming forward, turning on their likely only source of food, shelter, money, and stability in this country, knowing that the chance of convicting their captor is minimal at best, with that chance getting even lower if they can't afford to stick around for a few years, awaiting for a trial so they can testify against them. Or try and go it alone, keep their family out of it, and keep working in their current community, with no support, no friends, no money, and now forever looking over their shoulder. So surely the people have tried to prevent this from even happening in the first place. People have tried that, but like pushing down on a waterbed from one side, kind of simply just moves the problem from one side to the other. Very often touted solutions are things like close the borders to young women traveling with older men. But A, you're very likely to catch a bunch of innocent people. Well, now you've just created a larger market for people smugglers. Another option is extensive checks at the border. But as we see from the southern US border, the harder you make checkpoints, 
the more likely people are to simply brave the more deadly desert routes, and people dying in the desert is not an improvement in the situation. What about the other option? Why not ban all prostitution? There's a reason that industry has been around for as long as it has, and as we've seen before, by banning it, it simply pushes everything underground, out of the brothels and away from the panic buttons, the security, the health screening, and the age checks for the workers. And without these checks, the situation gets a lot darker very quickly. So how do you prosecute something that's happening possibly a million miles from here, or something that the victim is very unlikely to be able to come forward and help you with, even if their captor's still in the country? And that's one of the things that makes this particular issue so difficult to crack down on, and something I hope smarter people than myself can figure out a solution for. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. This was another episode a little bit different from our usual foray, but one that both myself and the staff really felt needed to be done, as we've been skirting around this issue for quite a long time now. So many episode notes would have chapters on this particular issue, we just didn't feel like we had time in these episodes for it, and really felt it did deserve a full piece. We hope it wasn't too depressing for you, and we'll be back next fortnight with our usual, much more geopoliticky episodes. On top of our usual geopoliticky episodes, we're putting out a whole bunch of new articles, panels, breaking news and videos over the next few days on subjects ranging from the Italian government's connections with Russian security services through to building tensions of the Taiwan Strait. And if you want to check out all of that, you can find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. This episode is dedicated to friend of the show, Mikolas Chiorenskas, who is the latest Patreon to sign up at the time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of our listeners like Mikolas, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep the show going. We really can't thank them enough. So this episode on human trafficking is dedicated to you, Mikolas. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Human Trafficking, a comprehensive exploration of modern day slavery by Wendy Stickle. For a deep dive into that industry. The second is Sex Trafficking, Inside the Business of Modern Slavery by Siddharth Kara, for a deeper focus on the sex industry. And the third is The Truth About Modern Slavery by Emily Kenway, for a deeper look on its impact in the global supply chain and for some real heart-wrenching first-person stories. I want to thank this week's guests, John Coyne, Gabby DeBellis, and Martina Vandenberg. All of you were incredibly helpful with research and writing on this piece and helped us cover this very complex topic. So thank you so much for all your help on this one. I also want to thank my staff, Wade McCarr, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniel Isabella, Isaac Gibbs, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Jamie Thanu, our media director, Ross Crabtree, our media advisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. The team keeps getting bigger and bigger and it allows us to go after bigger and better stories. That's not thanks to me, that's thanks to this team, and I really am grateful to have them on this project. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline Podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.